and I start to think more expansively that I could make art out of anything. And I'm not limited to working in wood or stone or glass or anything that comes along. I love how the art making journey can begin in the most unexpected, inconspicuous ways. Of course, the stories of all our beginnings are different for each of us. But regardless, something sparked you. Most likely, you know, on on an ordinary day in between doing things of not much importance. But then it happened. A chance meeting with someone. The first paragraph in a book you happened to glance at, left behind at your table by someone you didn't know. Or perhaps it was a piece of art you saw that changed everything. It increased the volume of the call to your art just loud enough that you couldn't somehow begin. For Daniel Wurzel, the Brooklyn-based air installation and performance artist, it was simply a leaf amazingly suspended above a subway air grate. It was hovering as if by magic 12 inches above the ground. Something about this moment stirred him. He couldn't let it go, so instead followed its path. Daniel Wurzel began. Today, Daniel's ethereal air sculptures have been seen in Cirque du Soleil and Amaluna, the Sochi Winter Olympics closing ceremony, and countless museums and science centers across the globe. His kinetic sculptures and installations combine the lightweight and poetic materials of paper, silk, and glitter with the most wondrous but invisible material of all. Air. Have a look at Daniel's extraordinary art by going to arttolife.com and clicking on podcasts. There you will find links to his upcoming performances and exhibitions, as well as links to find out more. Join me now as I catch up with Daniel in Brooklyn, New York. Welcome to Art to Life, a podcast for the creatively curious. My name is Nicholas Wilton, and each week I'll help you rediscover not just the art of your life, but the art in your life. Join me as we explore that perfect blue at twilight, the wild frontiers of art making, and the extraordinary joy of finding your way as you go. So Daniel, listen, thank you so much for joining us today. I can't wait to dive into these amazing air sculptures, as you call them, and just find out more about this really, really cool art form. So because this is not an art form that I talk about or until I have saw yours, can you give us your description of of what you're doing just to let the listeners know uh, before we dive into how you do this and when you started and all the rest? Right. Well, thanks for having me on, Nick. I appreciate that. And it's nice to be able to talk to you. Nice to have met you last week in San Francisco. And um, so I'm happy to, to do this. I work with airflow and I look at it as, as a medium in a way. And I've tried to, to understand its uh, behaviors. I, I, I've used many materials, lightweight materials in combination with various airflow patterns and I've created tornadoes, you know, uh, <laughs> like with a tight eye wall and I, I, these kinds of things. I do an uh, installation uh, called an air fountain, which is um, uh, a sort of a circle, a base, a uh, circular base. And um, air comes across the top surface of the base towards the center from every point around the perimeter of the circle. And when it gets to the middle, it has nowhere to go except up. And so it Ah. takes whatever materials are are with it and they fly and they recirculate because the the upward moving column of air is sort of at the center of the circle, the fabrics uh, or whatever material, uh, styrofoam, peanuts, feathers, uh, balloons, uh, uh, glitter, mylar, you know, confetti of various types. You put them in there and they go, they sweep across the top surface to the center. Then they go up uh, and I can control if they go up in a spiral or not, but they, I, I like it when they go up in a spiral and then they, they fall out of the air column down along the sides of that air column and in the invisible air column in the middle and they fall back onto the base and get swept around. And so it's sort of the pattern is a torus pattern, which you've seen images like the magnetic 
field of the earth. Oh, right. Yeah. That's a torus, that's a donut. Yes. And so uh, essentially, and, and so the fabrics go up the hole and then fall back down around the donut, you know, around the cakey part and then gets stuck back in. It's a horrible metaphor, but yeah, but there you go. For you guys listening, head on over uh, to art to life.com and click on podcasts and you got to see this work. I mean, it is, it is incredible. I mean, you know, it's like, until you see this, um, and th- th- these are so beautiful that literally, you know, imagine, you know, a, a, a tornado swirling paper glitter, you know, with figures moving through it or fabric that looks like ethereal smoke going up five stories and just moving around and it looks figurative. I mean, your work's figurative. It's abstract. It's it's so many kinds of things. It's but it's just so emotional. <laughs> you know, that's what that's what struck me. That's really true. And you know, people comment like on social media, and you know, people talk about an emotional having an emotional response. You know, to the work and feeling like if it's two fabrics, these are big fabrics. These are three meters by you know nine meters long. And they fly, you know, as high as you please. I can control some of that. I mean, some 40, 50 feet high. If, if in certain spaces, you can make them go really high. And but um, you know, they're up, they're down. It's fast, it's slow. Do you know? They get tangled a little bit, and they always come apart. Yeah. Why do they always come apart? That I was thinking. Oh my God. Why? You know, it's just, it's like water or something. You'd think it would yeah. all turn into a knot. It doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't. It's the fabric itself. And the ah. fabric that I use, some fabrics, like uh, if you take silk, if you ball it up, it stays balled up and will collapse into a, like a puddle on the floor. If you take other fabrics, like I'm using, excuse me, they they want to open up. So you crunch it down and it wants to open up. Right. And so this is... This handles the air much better. Um, the air can get under it and move it. And so that's that's kind of the secret there. You know, I'm a painter mostly. My best work is has a component where, you know, often I'm struggling with this, but I'm trying to make the materials do certain things. You know, I, I want to create yeah. forms and shapes and lines, but I'm also trying to make the materials be truthful and be themselves. and there's a truthfulness to the way these, your, these materials are moving, you know, silk does a certain thing. So you become the, you know, you're, you're curating this experience based on what the materials are naturally going to do in flight. Right. A hundred percent. Do you know, and, and what air does and how air behaves and, you know, it's invisible. So it's tricky. And it's like, <laughs> it's really, it's, I think I understand it. And then I, then I get totally like, I don't understand anything. And, and it fools me all the time. I have to make corrections and try different things. And I'm constantly like, you know, trying to zero in on some ideal, <laughs> ideal way that it wants to be. I, I kind of think of like, I'm, it has what, it has its own ways of being. And its own mm-hmm. its own parameters, its own like any material does, like your paint and things that it can say, and things that it connotes, and different inherent meanings. Every material, and all of these things kind of come into play. And in, when you're an artist, and you have to be there's a for me, I mean, uh, this is a little digression, but I'm all about materials, and this was sort of my entree into sculpture making, and. Mm. You know, I, I was most influenced, I guess, in college by sculptors like uh, Richard Serra and some of the conceptual, abstract, minimal guys where the idea was super clean. And the idea is, I mean, to me, there's the idea, there's the execution, there's, there's so many parts, but the idea is paramount. And, you know, what are you making? What kind of painting are you painting? Is it abstract? Is it figurative? What is it? Are you, you know, is it even on canvas? Is it, I don't know much about painting. I'm not sure, but. But, but the idea leads, takes the lead. You know, I can imagine, you know, you're in your studio trying to understand or figure out or, 
or produce a feeling? What is the best material? Is it pieces of paper? What, how that's what takes the day. Exactly. And hopefully it's a poetic, you know, on top of that, something that's simple and clean and there's poetry in there that you can, you know, that you can sustain, that can sustain your, your interest and your practice and something you don't know and something you have to learn and figure out. I love that. It's a practice of discovery. Yes. Wonder is the word that comes to mind that if, if we can experience something, if we, you know, we see these common materials that are around us and you're simply showing us a new way of experiencing them that truly hasn't been done before. I mean, you are the person who are, who is making these kind of flight, the air, atmospheric yeah. expressions. And that, you know, I mean, that is, that's, it's just so amazing. And I find it so interesting that you, you know, you look to like David Sarah, you know, Sarah, that his work is so, it's so different, you know, it's so solid and grounded and yours is so ethereal, but I get it. It's just, it's just so clean. I what it is, is he did this. And, and my other hugest influence, even more so, was the sculptor Izama Noguchi, Japanese-American sculptor who worked in stone. What I like about these guys is that they boil their work down to only what is essential. And they're making, you know, Noguchi worked with boulders and he did just enough to leave the mark of the human being. In, but he didn't, he didn't dominate these rocks. Yeah. I mean, he danced with them and his sculptures are a reflection of, of that. They're beautiful. And, you know, talking about these kinds of things, you know, stone has in Japan, they make rock gardens right? and different shaped stones have different meanings. Do you know, a tall stone is a figure and a flat stone and a, they all have different meanings and different connotations and different stories to tell in the spirit in a way. And he, worked with the spirit of stone and more than any other sculptor that I know of. Yeah. And so it was about what is essential. And I keep trying to pare my work down to only what is essential and lose all the embellishment. Tell me, you know, your art, you were said you were, were you in art school? I mean, how did you, how did you stumble in, into this, you know, into this medium that, Actually, there wasn't a medium like this before you did it. I mean, yeah, I studied architecture in college and I thought I wanted to build. I, I always like to build stuff with my hands, but I looked at architecture schools uh, for postgrad and I was like, I don't want to do that. And I want to work with my hands. I don't want to, you know, be behind a desk. And so I set about learning about a lot of materials and I learned about. And I, and I worked with stone and steel and glass, and I carved tree trunks with chainsaws outdoors for 10 oh years God. under a bridge. Really? Yeah. Really? I mean, giant tree trunks. I'd get them delivered on these boom trucks from tree trimmers. And I had, you know, it was all outdoors. And I had an overhead bridge crane there from some previous steel yard. And I just, I carved Crazy, like crazy for years. Really? With chainsaw? You can say certain things. I guess this is the point about materials is you can say certain things if you're carving tree trunks with wood that you can't say with other materials. If you're going to make a bronze sculpture, you're competing with every bronze sculpture that's ever been made in the history of mankind. Do you know? So in a way, because it's a bronze sculpture. Right. We think of Rodin for sure. You for know. instance. Right. You know? I mean, when you said that, I thought of Rodin. You know? Figurative work is equally hard. Do you know, you're, you're competing against people who, you know, were trained in the academia, you know, since the age of 10, you know, and the whole <laughs> culture was about training artists and other artist studios. And they learned, they had a whole different education and it's hard to, it's, it's hard to compete. And the, the, the thing about art is that you, you can make art out of anything, do you know? And there's artists that do, do you know? There's a guy who tattoos pigs, do you know? Uh, and there's, there's another guy who made a, uh, his Vim Delvoy, another guy, Tom Sachs, who made a machine 
that mimics the stomach. And it's a big machine and it, you, it's got all these different stages and it digests foods and it poops at the end. And this was championed. It's crazy, you know, it, and the art world is like inscrutable. It's like, how, how does this, how does this get? But again, it's the idea that's important about that work. So, you know, you can make art out of chewing gum or dirty air or Cheetos or, you know, soup cans, you know? Yes, yes. And people do. I'd work with so many different kinds of materials and they could each say what they could say. But then I got to a point when I was like, you know what, when I changed my opinion and I start to think more expansively that I could make art out of anything and I'm not limited to working in wood or stone or glass or anything that comes along. For me early on, you know, we think, oh, well, I'm going to be a painter or I'm going to be this, but I'm just curious, how were you able to open up your mind? What catalyzed that? I mean, I love that. That was it. It's a, it's a conscious act of consciously trying to free your mind from the t- traditional constraints that you've put on art making. Like, okay, you're a painter. So I'm going to, if I was a painter, I'd think, okay, I'm going to paint on canvas and I'm going to order boards and I'm going to order my paints and I'm just going to paint, paint, paint. But what if you decided you wanted to go out and I don't know, paint on a tree, mm-hmm. for instance, or something, uh, something crazy. Yeah, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. Right. Just stretch it. Yeah. So stretch it. Or you decide, you know, you want to, I don't know, the guys who walk around in the landscape, like Andy Goldsworthy, do you know, yeah. they're just making poetry on the spot. Yeah. You know, with, what they, with what they got. Yeah. Yeah. It's, oh, it's, it's so it's, good. It's kind of beautiful. I mean, it's, it's a leap of faith. It's scary. Mm-hmm. I was in between series of works. I was kind of bored with what I was doing. You said you did these tree logs, chainsaw sculpture, and we'll get some photos of everyone. But I'm just curious, is it, were they kind of totem, obviously totem like, or? Get into all kinds of stuff. I mean, I did some figurative work. I carved satyrs. I was interested in mythological archetypal imagery at the time. Do you know, mm. cave, I was looking at cave paintings and I was looking at the bull jumpers from the Minoan, from Minoan art, which is quite beautiful. I was looking at Tang Dynasty horses from China. Uh, you know, these to me are quintessential. They're some of the best sculpture that the world has ever produced. And so I was, again, at that time in my life, still trying to get to something essential, something quintessential, something in a, the essence of yes of it and so i was looking at those things and making wooden sculptures what i was going to say before is that about that jump that i made you know from from like okay i don't have to think about making sculpture in traditional ways i can i can think about it any way i want and at that point i found like my eyes got a little wider and i was willing to entertain do you know crazy ideas, do you know, or, or different ideas. So, and I went through a, several series of work, including making uh, giant jello sculptures. I invented a recipe uh-huh. that wouldn't rot, shrink, melt, decay, and the jello basically lasts forever, but it had to be monumental, you know, because jello, nobody's ever going to forget an eight by eight by eight foot cube of, of this gelatin based material. And I haven't even seen it, but I don't think I'll ever forget it either. <laughs> it's, now it's in your mind. Yes. Uh, yeah. The images, I think, are on my website. Oh, but, my God. Um, that's so awesome. But then one day I was, I was driving to work and I saw in New York, in Brooklyn, I saw a leaf above a grate in the sidewalk oh. and where the subway comes in and that like yes. Marilyn Monroe dress oh. moment. And the leaf was just suspended, you know, about... I don't know, two feet maybe off the ground and the stem of the leaf. It was a maple leaf was the, is the heaviest part. And so that was Uh kind of hanging straight down and it was just staying in one space and spinning around and around and around that axis. uh, And it just stood there and I was watching it from inside my car. And, you know, I'm sure I'm the only one that saw it, you know, but Uh it was, it was so 
a moment in time. And I was like, you know what? That is so amazing. And Mm. during this time, again, I kind of trained my mind to be open to stop myself. When I see something like this, stop, pay attention to, you know, what is it? What am I looking at? What's so amazing here? And so I drove a couple more blocks and I circled back to try to find that leaf and it had blown away. And, but I went out and got some fans and I tried to replicate that and I've never been able to do it. Oh, interesting. Still, it, it was just a moment, you know, in nature. Yeah. But I learned a lot of other stuff along the way and developed all of this work with hair. So I have to share with you, it is so emotional, you know, I mean, just picturing that leaf. But when I saw in particular the tornado or the swirling paper sculpture, I had an experience and it's interesting. It was in Italy many years ago and I was with my daughters were like, mm, I think they were I feel like probably five and seven. And we were at a, we were sitting at this table and there had been a wedding in this little piazza, small kind of courtyard. I mean, it was all kind of walled off and all, and everyone was kind of eating outside, you know, it was this beautiful eating these, and my daughters were kind of, you know, they had these really pretty little dresses on and they're playing around and the wedding, there had been a wedding in this courtyard and there were millions of these little paper flowers that were on the tables and and they had cleaned up, but they were all around. And we were sitting there and all of a sudden the weather changed and the storm came in and everyone was kind of like grabbing their plates and running inside. And the wind came through these buildings in this courtyard and the sun was going down. It was the light was changing and these colored flowered leaves were swirling around and my daughters were totally running in them. It was just like, and, and it, what's crazy, and I'll have to look it up because I filmed it. I had a camera, like a, it wasn't like, that wasn't when we were using phones, yeah, you know, but yeah, I filmed yeah. this beautiful, like twilight scene of these little girls with these spinning kind of clouds and of these paper flowers. It was so, so moving. I'll, I'll never forget it. Isn't it amazing? Yeah. And the, sometimes nature serves up these gifts, you know, and I was watching, we have a swimming pool and I was watching the insects. They're these tiny little flies and teeny little things and they fly in clusters and they all were moving up and then down and there's, you know, thousands of them and, yes. it, and they move together like a murmuration or, or something like this. And this is the way nature organizes itself. It's chaos. Yes. Is what it is. Of course. And that's an amazing book, you know, a chaos by uh, James Glyke. Um, this okay. book kind of changed my life. It's, it's readable. But it's a whole, uh, it, it describes chaos theory, which is present in so many different things mm. in, in the world and gives us a better handle on how to think about chaotic systems. And, you know, when you said murmuration, you know, the birds, the, I've watched those and filmed those and, and it really is true. I mean, what maybe that's, I mean, that is it. It is of us, you know, Yeah. energy that we can't see, you know, the sound waves that, you know, when you put it through and you get like sand on the, on the speaker and it makes these gorgeous forms like, yeah, right. There's so much that we don't see. And then there's the whole microscopic world. Do you know? And I've looked for inspiration there too. If you look up like forums, F-O-R-A-M-S, they're tiny little sea creatures, little shell creatures, and they're microscopic or, you know, even viruses can be beautiful or bacteria or things that we don't, that there's so much that's all around us that we don't have the equipment to perceive. Mm -hmm. It's like the, in American beauty, you know, he says there's so much beauty in the world. Do you know when that plastic bag was flying around? Yes. Yes. And he's right. And it's like, as artists, I think we need to kind of like pay attention to small things and then try to think laterally and say, okay, what if it was bigger? What if I did this? What if it was blue? What if it was, I I don't know, whatever it is. And, and try to expand on some poetic idea that comes to you. Yes. That then it's inexcusable or, or it's, 
we can't help but notice it now. I mean, that's what you've done. You've, you've taken that leaf idea that we're all driving by rushing to work and you put it in, I mean, you do this, you know, the Olympic games and the, you yeah. know, these huge installations that, and, and light it. And, you know, when I've seen your work, I was watching some of it, you know, on some of these YouTube videos, do you usually incorporate music or sound with it? And do you choose that? Sometimes I do. You were right. My work kind of sits at an intersection of a lot of different fields. Mm -hmm. So there's the dance and science and performance and oh, so you know, art. And right now, you know, I, I have a show with 147 Mark Chagall paintings touring Brazil this year and in four different museums there at the Science Museum in San Francisco, the Exploratorium, which is I was there to do that installation when you and I met, and that'll be up for, I think, the summer. So um, people can go there if they want to see it. But yeah, I, a lot of stuff is in performance. And so on Broadway or with Cirque du Soleil or different shows, the Olympics and Sochi, you know, and there it's this music is not my choice. But especially with kinetic artwork, I think music carries most of the emotional punch is in the music. This is this kind of allows people to open their eyes and see what they're see what they're looking at. It's a way in. It's it's a portal into the human, you know, psyche in a way that allows people to to then be more receptive. Yes, yeah. That's what's so amazing about music that it just transports and it opens people. But I love that for you, it's like the gateway. And then, and then they're looking at something that actually is abstract and is feels it's musical really, because there you have movement. Yeah. It's a, you know, it's a lucky thing, you know, it's like, I, I never had, you know, these sorts of ambitions as a, as a younger artist. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I only had sort of art world ambitions. And I thought, you know, well, if I'm lucky, one day I'll get a museum show and I'll have a gallery somewhere in New York and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And uh, the art world is like, I was never into marketing myself, you know, in whatever ways I had some success there, but, you know, I worked basically for 25 years in the dark. You know, I showed up at my studio and I took it seriously and I did it every day and I could and all the time. And I was actively you know, engaged in the process, but, you know, not until I started, until I got into this work, which I, I thought had zero economic potential. You know, when I started out, I started out with a circle of fans on the floor and yeah. the fabric that flies in the middle. And I was like in my, in my warehouse studio and it was like, okay, well, that's pretty cool. Do you know, but I thought, how are you going to sell that? Yes. You know, oh how are you going to make God. a living doing that? Oh my God. You know, oh but, my then God. The, but then the performance world came knocking and they I put up some videos and they started to get a little traction. And then Cirque du Soleil called. That was my first client. And I did oh, a, wow. a show with them. And then, you know, it started to take off from there. When you had that first show or when you, your early work and, you know, obviously it moved you, but what kind of reactions did you get? What were those early kind of signals to you that this was, this was a thing. This wasn't just you, you know, this, this is universal. What you did it. I mean, you've yeah. got something here that archetypal essential, it transcends language. It's not cultural. It, any human being will be moved. I mean, I can't imagine such a thing. Did you, when did that hit? When did that arrive? I felt the magic, you know, myself, the first time I put something in the middle of that circle and it didn't fly great, you know, but it moved. And, you know, the fans I had were underpowered and this, I hadn't figured out how to set them up and all of this business. And, but there was this glimpse of like, look, it flies. And, yeah. you know, so I think that the meaning that people ascribe to this is I don't take any responsibility for that. Do you know, if you mm -hmm. look at this and you think, you know, this is a dance of soul, 
uh, of souls and that it, you know, one woman wrote to me that she wants to watch these videos as she's dying, you know, and people, you know, it was like, ugh, you know, that's amazing. Ah, uh, you know, and, and I think she was dying at the time so many years ago. But um, the beauty of my work, in a way, is that there's no hand of the artist there. Yes. I've kind of erased myself. I've just set up this system that just flows and it just repeats. And so I'm not comfortable in front of the camera. I'm much more of a backstage kind of person, <laughs> you know, but that suits me. And, but it's better, you know, because uh, I'm not telling people what to think. And the fabrics have their own... You're right. They have their own motions and their own ways of acting that are completely natural because they're, they're only being acted upon by air. Mm. And air is, you know, you talked about that vortex that you saw. Yes. You know, this is one of the ways that air naturally wants to organize itself is in a vortex. And it happens in nature all the time and tornadoes and these sorts of the, the mm-hmm. vortex that you talked about with the flower petals happens all the time, but we don't see it because there's no, not a lot of flower petals everywhere. Right, right. You know, but as yeah. you walk down the street, there's little vor- vortices following you. As you close a door, there's a vortex. You know, the whole length of that door, when you close a door on the suction side, it creates a little spinning thing. And ah. if, you, if you have a dusty floor like I do, you can see the dust spinning in a circle. So, yeah, it's happening all around us. All this beauty. If we could see what airflow looked like, actually, how amazing would that be? There's such a humility to this. It's like, I mean, I just am moved by, you know, how you removing yourself from this. But yeah, that's a certain kind of, there's control. You know, flight is control in a way. It's, it's yeah. also a letting go. Right. And, you know, these sort of opposites and, and there's just something so beautiful about like you just listening to how you're talking about this and you're just such a good spokesperson for life. I mean, for these natural systems and, yeah. I, you know, it's just, it's just, that's so beautiful really that to hold this art form so loosely and just let it just let it do its thing and then stand back in the audience with us all and just wonder. <laughs> yeah. In this way, I'm kind of a, a facilitator. Yeah. You know? and, and, and I'm, my process is to figure out what does it want from me and to try to reduce and reduce and reduce into only what is essential. And that seems to work the best. And so my ideas start out sometimes a little complex, but you know, I heard this one guy say, and I thought it was true. You only get to simplicity after going through a lot of complexity. And I think that that's, there's some truth to that as well. Absolutely. When you have these ideas, do you draw them? Do you, how do you, or is it literally experimentation in a studio with, do you have 20 people helping you? Or I mean, how does, how do you, how do you make this work? How do you iterate, I guess? My work is sort of like, there's several parts of it. I do a lot of prototyping in my studio Mm -hmm. and I work with basic tools, you know, like table saw and router and, you know, whatever hand tools and things like this. And, And I build prototypes of, of whatever it is that I'm making. Then yeah, I make a video of the, of the prototype and put it up online, uh, my website and Vimeo, YouTube. I just got into Instagram and uh, LinkedIn is a, is, it seems to be a good source for me. Uh, I just found out this week, the last week, a, a lot of requests coming through there, although I had ignored it for a long time. I'm sort of surprised, actually. Uh, LinkedIn doesn't feel, I guess it's business. They want to express something and they would call through there. I, uh, yeah, my clients are like that. You know, my clients are, are business people. They're event companies. They are creative directors of various things. They're the brand themselves. I'm doing a pharmaceutical sh- event, you know, in Germany uh, shortly with these new 
things. I mean, there's many, there's many different kinds. Yeah, yeah. The events are sort of like, I don't even do that part. I sent, I have a team that goes and sets these things up. Unless it's something I'm really interested in, like a theatrical show where I might have more input uh, rather than, you know, and, and creative decision-making rather than just go set up an air fountain. Mm-hmm. So you can send specifications and instructions to a team in Tel Aviv and, and then they send you videos of it or, or you know, or they, is it live stream so you can make adjustments or? Well, these, these are known things, you know, the air fountains I that I use for those purposes. I have some in my studio here. I have several that are in Europe. I have one now in the Middle East where we do a lot of shows, things like that. And so those recirculate and they get used for a week here or a couple of nights there, or one night event company maybe is hosting, you know, this, whatever event they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or a commercial thing as well, but that's the less interesting part, you know, for me. And yeah, I've figured out systems. Like I have a business manager in England. He takes care of most of this. So a lot of that stuff is a little hands off. So the, the dream projects or the things that you're working on the front end of this, of this work is you in, in a giant space that you can control? And is it just you mostly? You know, I sometimes have assistance in my own studio. I generally yeah. like to work alone. And I just find like uh, when I'm working, I'm flowing. Yeah. You know, and I'm moving from one thing and you know this, yeah. you go from one painting to the next. You can just keep moving and during the day. And so flow is kind of, that's important. Yeah, absolutely. The work you make is so big. It just takes my mind to places. I can't imagine how, like I can change a shape in about 15 minutes, 20 different ways till I figure it out. But your work is so big, you know, changing it and modifying and learning as you go is just something that would be so different. Yeah, it is. uh, I'm still, I still don't feel like I have it all nailed down. Not at all. And I'm still learning. God, that's so great. Yeah. So it's, um, it's, it's been an amazing, amazing ride. So what do you, in, we're going to, we're sort of wrapping up here and I'm just, I just have so many questions, but what are you most excited about coming up for you or what, where is your work going that you're intuitively interested in or what, where do you think? So I've been working for the last, since COVID started, I was in my studio again, full time. And, and not doing other things. So it was a good time. And I, I wanted to develop the idea, this air fountain uh, idea with the fabrics, but on a much smaller scale. It's great for stages or for stadiums or for big, you know, lobbies and public spaces, but could I do it on a, on a much more intimate scale? And it's a different setup. It turned out to be very difficult, but I'm nailing it now. And so I'm producing this series of air tables that, uh, you know, are like a meter and a half in diameter or a meter in diameter. And they send, you know, fabrics flying. And, but you could be in your living room or it could be uh. in a hotel lobby or it could be in, you know, lots of different spaces. And so I think that it'd be great to kind of increase the accessibility of the work. And it's, you don't really lose any of the, of the poetry, but the, certainly the engineering uh, to make these was far more difficult. Mm. Uh, just because a smaller scale is, you know, when a bigger scale, you can dominate the air flow <laughs> yeah, in the right. room. When you go smaller, you know, you're more subject to the, to the environment. And you have to be, therefore, far more precise. Yes. Yes. It's, it's interesting, right? Like, you're kind of going back to that maple leaf above that subway grate. Yeah. Yeah. And I keep, I keep wondering, am I done with air? Do you know, have I said everything? Mm -hmm. I I, Uh I feel like I've kind of picked most of the low hanging fruit. do you know Mm -hmm. what? And I'm like, well, what's next? What's next? You know, which is kind of the perennial question for artists. Like, okay. Yes. Yes. But I'm still involved. Yeah. And so engaged. Yeah. So I'm just curious, uh, just wrapping here, the, if there's sort of 
a nugget or two of the things that you've really learned along the way here from working with this kind of invisible medium? Like what's the big sort of lesson here or maybe that you could share with us? You know, one thing I wanted to touch on before is Mm -hmm. that you had mentioned is that you said, you know, you've kind of taken yourself out of this and there's, I think I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about that because I didn't used to do that. You know, my work was far more personal and it was about things that I liked, do you know? Mm -hmm. And as artists, I think, you know, you have some choices about what is your subject matter. And in fact, this is maybe the most important choice of all is what is your subject matter? And for me, making art about my own personal likes or dislikes or things that I gravitated towards or was repulsed by, do you know, it's all, it's also introspective, do you know? And it's about me, 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 yeah, me, me. I get that. What do I want? What's, it, what's important to me? Do you know? What is it that I have to say? And it led to feeling like, you know, I'd be working alone in my studio for years and nobody would see what I'm doing except my friends who'd come over and I'm making work about me. And it just felt kind of isolated and lonely. And, you know, like, why am I so special? Do you know that I, do I really have something, you know, that's so different and unique that I can offer? I mean, this is what the world wants from its artists. It wants authenticity and and originality, I think. And so I just, you know, feel like when I shifted my focus onto something that was outside of myself, do you know, uh, uh, it could be like the culture. If you're an artist, it could could be anything, uh, science. Mm -hmm. It could be Mm -hmm. some phenomenon in nature. It could be some politics. It could be, I I don't know. It could be anything in the world that's not you, you know, and focus on that. Yeah. And that's a kind of a different way of approaching art. So it can be about your personal experience, what it's like to be a human being. What is the human condition? Do you know, as a broad subject matter, or it can be about the culture. It can be about the universe and, and those sorts of things. But um, it doesn't only have to be about, for me, I'm much more comfortable in, 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 and at peace in my own mind, not having to decide every morning, well, what's most important to me? You know, what do I feel like saying today? And oddly, that, that come from then becomes wildly personal for all of us. It's accessible. Or, or there's an invitation. The invitation's so much bigger. That's such a beautiful idea. I have no ego about this in a way. I yeah. feel like, like I just, I discovered something that was already there. Do you know? And here it is, you know, that's it. Wow. Daniel, listen, super privileged to hear about this and, and uh, just your whole experience and your, your world. It's just really, really inspiring. So thank you so, so much. Thank you, Nick. I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks for listening to the Art to Life show. If you enjoyed the podcast, please help me get the word out by sharing it with your friends on Instagram at art to life underscore world. The recording of this and all episodes, along with a place to leave comments, see additional photos, and discover a whole new approach to making art can be found by going to arttolifepodcast.com. And secondly, if you could leave a rating and review in whatever app you're listening on today, I would super, super appreciate it. It makes a big difference. And last but not least, before you go, if you'd like to be on my artist list, every Sunday morning, I send out a video blog all about art making. Go to arttolivepodcast.com to sign up. And all these links are in the show notes, of course. Thanks so much for being here, and we'll see you next week.